the honorary degree will now be conferred. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Jeremy Vendetti to present the honorary degree candidate, Dr. Robert Thurth. Jeremy Vendetti is a geomorphologist in the geography department who studies how landscapes develop and evolve through time. He runs the Environmental Fluid and Sediment Dynamics Laboratory in the Faculty of Environment where he uses a model river to study, to study river dynamics, flooding, ecological restoration of river systems. Dr. Vendetti. Mr. Chancellor, Dr. Robert Thursk is Canada's most accomplished astronaut. He inspires Canadians' imaginations and interest in what lies beyond our earthbound lives and clearly demonstrates what can be de accomplished with a good education, determination, and hard work. Dr. Thursk grew up in our own backyard in New Westminster, British Columbia, before going on to earn multiple degrees in mechanical engineering, medicine, and business. He was selected for the Canadian Astronaut Program in 1983 and went on to hold the Canadian records for the longest space flight at 187 days and the most time in space at 204 days. His first space flight was in 1986 aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia. He and his crewmates of the Life and Microgravity Space Lab mission undertook 43 experiments devoted to biology, physiology, fluid physics, and material sciences. Dr. Thursk is a true pioneer. In 2009, he became the first Canadian astronaut to fly a long duration expedition aboard the International Space Station and became a member of its first permanent crew of six. Over his six months on the space station, he and his crewmates performed an unprecedented amount of multidisciplinary research including projects with our own physics professor, Dr. Barbara Friskin, on the effects of weightlessness on colloidal materials, and with SFU kinesiologist, Dr. Andrew Blaber, on the effects of spaceflight on the cardiovascular system. On Earth, he has maintained a strong dedication to research, having led international teams in cardiovascular and visual perception research. He has had the unique experience of being both a physician and a test subject in space, where his own heart, muscles, bones, and other body systems have become objects of research. In addition to this impressive resume of pioneering space flights and research, Dr. Thursk has shown a profound commitment to science education. He has been instrumental in providing unique learning opportunities for students including SFU undergraduates at the Canadian Space Agency. Indeed, it was an SFU undergraduate who helped him train for his 2009 expedition and monitored his health and fitness through that mission. His encouragement has forever shaped the lives of the young people with whom he has interacted. In the words of one of the students from SFU that he worked with at the Canadian Space Agency, he has inspired me to set new benchmarks for myself, to dream bigger, and to work harder. I cannot imagine a better qualification for the honor that our university is about to confer upon him. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of the Senate of this university, I ask that you now confer upon Dr. Robert Thursk the degree of Doctor of Science, honoris causa. Robert Thirst, by virtue of the authority vested in me and in the Senate of this university, I hereby admit you to the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa. Dr. Thirst will be hooded by Dr. John Driver, Vice President Academic, and Dr. Kate Ross, Registrar.
permission Thank you. to go sign the book. It is with great pleasure that I now call on Dr. Robert Thirsk for his convocation address. Dr. Thirsk. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, members of the Board of Governors and Senate, faculty, honored guests, graduates, families and friends, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today. Two years ago, I wore a space suit and gazed out a spacecraft window at a galaxy of stars. Today, I wear a convocation gown and I'm staring out at a galaxy of future stars. In May 2009, two crewmates and I launched to space in a Soyuz capsule atop a Russian rocket and an ascending pillar of flame and smoke. Returning to Earth six months later in the same spacecraft remains one of the most vivid memories of my astronaut career. After undocking from the International Space Station, our capsule plummeted through the upper atmosphere as a fireball. Descent through the lower atmosphere was a wild, jarring ride akin to going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. At the end of a nominal mission, a Soyuz capsule lands under parachute with its crew on the steps of Kazakhstan. But in an emergency, it could land in an ocean, anywhere in the world. Following a water landing, the crew must exit the capsule by themselves and survive alone in the ocean for up to two days. One of my most grueling days as an astronaut took place a few years ago during water survival training in the Black Sea of the Ukraine. The scenario for our simulated exercise was that my crew had just performed an emergency deorbit and now our Soyuz capsule was adrift in an ocean. We were to take off our spacesuits, put on several layers of thermal protective clothing and a watertight rubberized suit. Although encumbering and hot. This clothing would protect us against the frigid water temperature. We would then open the hatch of our capsule, jump out into the Black Sea, and wait for the search and rescue crews to locate us and retrieve us. I must mention that three men in a Soyuz capsule is like three men in a telephone booth. It's impossible for the crew to do much of anything all at once. For our exercise, one crew member laid across the laps of the other two while we worked together to remove the spacesuit and put on the survival gear. The secret to success to complete the training is, before, is to do this before our body core temperatures rise too high. Working at an optimal pace is critical. If we work too fast, our core body temperatures will increase due to an elevated metabolic rate. If we work too slowly, we will also overheat under the multiple layers of thermal garments that we wear and in the stifling cabin atmosphere. We failed the training exercise. As our body temperatures rose from 36 degrees Celsius to 39 degrees, we became drenched in sweat and our spirit and efficiency fell. After two draining hours of struggling to get into survival gear, not even one of us was completely suited. Our core body temperatures were high and rising. The medical doctors who were monitoring the exercise became alarmed and aborted the run. The three of us exited the capsule, exhausted and demoralized. If this had been our actual landing day, 
my crewmates and I would have died from hyperthermia inside the capsule or from hypothermia in the ocean. Why have I told you a gloomy story of failure on this, your day of convocation, a day when we're gathered together to celebrate and recognize success? I told you this story to share the fact that the trajectory to academic, professional, and personal success is not straight and smooth. Space exploration is no kidding difficult. The harsh environment can be unforgiving. Astronauts are consequently expected to live and work at the extremes of our capabilities. As students, you also overcame obstacles in your pursuit of university degrees. We must both face our unique impediments with determination. My crewmates and I were determined to successfully complete the Black Sea Water Survival Training. And that's why we pushed ourselves to do it again. We reviewed each step of the procedure, we adjusted our work pace, and we were ultimately and joyfully successful during a second attempt. In spite of its challenges, I can't imagine any career so fulfilling and downright fun as being an astronaut. Astronautics is synonymous with exploration. One great thing about my job is the repeated opportunities to explore, inwardly as well as outwardly, to discover the limits of my personal capabilities as well as the frontiers of the external world. In the Black Sea, I didn't just explore the limits of my physical capabilities, but the limits of my mental and emotional ones as well. I discovered, for instance, that my energy, cognitive abilities, and willpower shut down when my core body temperature reaches 39 degrees. A couple of years later, during my International Space Station expedition, I discovered that living in an isolated, confined environment for six months makes me homesick for my family and Earth. I discovered that maneuvering multi-billion dollar spacecraft safely and precisely with Canada's robotic arm requires supreme mental concentration. I discovered that relating well with five people of different nationalities, cultures, beliefs, and native languages requires the utmost in psychosocial skills. Some of the skills required of an astronaut come harder to me than others. Learning foreign languages is my Achilles heel. While I may not be the most linguistically gifted person in the world, I bet I am one of the most persistent. What I may lack in natural ability, I make up with determination to reach what may seem impossible. If I've been successful in my career, it's because I have had these repeated opportunities to function at the limits of my personal capabilities. It's when I function outside of my comfort zone that my performance is highest and my achievements are most meaningful. Exploration is a basic instinct of humans, whether it be inwardly or outwardly directed. Outward exploration of our physical world is about breaking through barriers, barriers of height, of depth, of location, of capability, of knowledge. People sit up and take notice when someone climbs Mount Everest for the first time, or when someone dives the depths of the ocean and discovers the wreck of the Titanic, or when someone leaves Earth orbit and ventures into the solar system. I'm proud to have represented Canada in outer space, while space exploration has provided many pragmatic benefits, one of its greatest symbolic benefits is that it bolsters our national spirit of exploration. It inspires us to contemplate the unknown, to attempt the difficult. Today, when we speak of outward exploration, we no longer refer solely to geographical frontiers. Most of the regions of the world have now been charted. Rather, the new frontiers of exploration are in the arts, sciences, technology, medicine, and management. There is much left to discover. The basis of disease, the riddle of consciousness, the nature of dark matter, the meaning of humanity. Some contemporary explorers wear parkas. Other explorers wear lab coats, pressure suits, scuba gear, and business suits. Still others carry video cameras or a paint palette. You 
have graduated from a university that is not named after a city or a province or a benefactor. You are graduates of a university that is named after an explorer. Simon Fraser worked at the limits of his abilities to chart unknown lands, to navigate difficult rivers, and to establish new communities. The name of this great explorer is now part of your curriculum vitae, and his spirit is now part of your being. With your diplomas soon in hand, my wish is that you find challenging work that you passionately enjoy, that you're good at, and that provides value to society. To the 2011 graduates of Simon Fraser University, live at the limits of your capabilities, expand the scope of your skills, and break through the barriers of knowledge. This convocation ceremony represents your launch pad. Begin to explore. Good luck. Thank you, Dr. Thirst.